Thank you, Ms. Pravina. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Thank you for attending this session. My name is Dana Tamatam. I'll be talking about child protection at schools. So I'm currently working as a child protection officer in my school. And I'll be, I have attended several workshops you know, of, about this topic. So I would like to share my knowledge and experience with you all. Okay, so this session will mainly focus on what is child abuse, types of child abuse, and how to identify, uh, I mean, what are the signs and symbols of the child abuse, and what is child protection at school? So basically, what is, I mean, we as educators, what is our responsibilities of child protection, and how, what, what arrangements or what practices that the school should have for the child protection? So let me talk about what is child protection. This is a key term that we all must understand when we are dealing with the you know, children. So child protection is creating a safe environment, okay, where children are respected, protected, empowered, and active in their own protection. So respected, I mean that children have, are given their own space, okay, whether in classroom or outside the classroom. Okay, wherever they are with us, they are given their own space and they should feel protected and they should be given opportunity to voice their opinion. Okay, so and irrespective of the age, okay, right, starting from the EYP to DPR, you know, 11th and 12th, whichever age grade. So children should be given, you uh, know, uh, opportunity to voice their opinion and they should feel that they are in safe environment. So it is our responsibility to create a safe environment where the children are respected. Now, why is it important? So what is the importance of child protection? So child protection is not a new subject. Okay, okay. So the this has been there, this concept has been there for the years and generations. Okay, the reason we are talking about this now very prominently because we are living in a digitalized world where children are exposed to a lot of, you know, uh, risk. There are so many, you know, uh, the society is ever changing and children are exposed to so many things where they are vulnerable to their safety. So it is ensured that students are prevented from abuse, neglect and exploitation. OK, so children, they spend most of the time with us in school. It is our responsibility to ensure that children are prevented from the abuse, neglect, and exploitation. And child protection is also important to allow students to have an impactful learning. Impactful learning means the child, okay, the students have a meaningful and authentic learning which is relevant to them. So it is that is why child protection plays a key role in school environment. Okay, so what do, what do we understand by the term child abuse? Okay, there are different meanings for it. Okay, child abuse is a violation of children's human rights. So like us, children are also given rights. Child rights are there. As I mentioned earlier, children at this age, so the child means, I hope you all know that, who is you know, under the age of 18. Anyone who is under the age of 18 called as child. Okay, so children are given set of human rights which are protected, guaranteed by the United Nations Convention of Rights of Child Children. So as the, when their wild rights are violated, so that is called as child abuse. So these rights you know, may be violated physically or emotionally or sexually and neglecting them. So child abuse is, includes a lot of various types. So when children are, when their rights are violated and which, uh, which causes harm to their education and development is called as child abuse. So how to identify that? Okay, what are the signs and symbols of child abuse? When you see a sudden change in their behavior, okay? So behavior, the sudden changes means they might show, I mean, they're becoming angry or anxious or nervous or, you know, fearful or, you know, uh, um, talk, not talking at all or talking so much 
or no, I mean, keeping themselves isolated, any changes in their behavior, which is not normal with that particular child. And if you see that the child is withdrawal or aggressive, becoming aggressive, okay? And sometimes, you know, they have the physical signs or their body, okay? Unexplained the bruises or injuries, okay? Cuts or redness or bumps or any, any signs that are visible on their body. And sometimes the child, you know, loses weight. So if there is a sudden weight change, okay? And academic impact, if their education, if their academic is impacted, okay, I mean, the poor performance, slowly their academic performance is, you know, going down. Or frequent absence. So you see that there is a regular absenteeism with that child. So these are some of the signs and symbols that we, could, we may consider to identify that whether the child has been abused. So what is safeguarding? This is the third key term, okay? I first talked about what is just safe child protection and next is child abuse and the third one is child safeguarding. So safeguarding is, you know, having the policies or practices or some of the uh, systems in place, okay, to prevent the children from harm. So safeguarding is, you know, in the, in the process of safeguarding, it is important that we educate all the key players. So key players here, both family and educators as teachers. So both family and educators should be given a proper awareness on child protection and child safeguarding to prevent the children from the harm and risk. Okay, so... Here is a short video for us to understand what is the what are the type what is safeguarding and types of child abuse. What is safeguarding? It's about the preventative action. It's about taking the necessary steps to prevent issues like bullying, harassment, discrimination abuse, and neglect. Our safeguarding policy aims to promote the safety and well-being of learners and employees, all to ensure we have a safe training environment. We also encourage you to inform us of any problems you have experienced or witnessed. What are the main issues regarding safeguarding? There are five main issues. Bullying, harassment, discrimination, abuse, neglect. There are different types of bullying, like verbal, physical, by text, or online. Harassment can be in the form of sexual harassment, stalking, or intimidation. Discrimination. This can be any negative attitude or action because of a person's gender, religion, race, or sexual orientation. Abuse can come in the form of sexual, physical, and also emotional abuse. And finally, neglect. By depriving someone of their basic needs, educational needs, or neglecting them psychologically. We feel... Okay. So, yeah, that's what, I mean, these are the types of the abuse children are exposed to, too. okay? So now what, what should staff do, okay? What is our responsibility? So all staff must report to suspected incidences, okay? If you happen to hear or see or, you know, uh, happen to know about that any child is, I know, undergoing a abuse or ex subjected to abuse, it is important that you report to the, we report the suspected incidences or reports to the, a person who is responsible. Every school has the different practices. Okay, for example, some schools have a responsible person who is called as child protection officer. 
in some schools there is a you know a child a carer so like that there are there is a person there is a team of the people who is responsible for the child protection so staff if they happen to know about any child who is suspected of child abuse so we have to report to that responsible person besides that we have other responsibilities too so what are the other responsibilities of the staff so never abuse and exploit a student in our actions or in our behavior any way that places a child at a risk of harm so we all are human beings okay we work with emotions so i mean unintentionally we might you know uh, talk to a child or we might behave to a child in i mean sometimes that hurt the child that put the child in risk or harm so we should be very careful that our actions or words should not hurt the child's emotions or feelings or should see that the children are not at any risk of harm and you know report any as i mentioned earlier we have to report any suspected child abuse to the person responsible so it is very important see now the legal the legal framework is very strong our legal systems are very strong in india to i you know with respect to the child protection and child abuse so failure to report to any child protection issues that should i mean that results in the disciplinary action because our responsibility is not only teaching the children it is also to play a role in the child's growth okay their development so child protection is important in children growth and development okay and now respond to a child who may have been abused or exploited so if any child approached to you approached us we should respond to them okay we should give them an opportunity to explain what has happened to them and very very important and last but not the least is not to store students pictures in personal devices okay nowadays okay to uh, i mean to to record the classroom learning or for to create the evidences we we tend to keep you know we tend to click pictures of students engaged in learning activities okay that is okay but we should not store those the pictures in our devices once we click the using first of all i would suggest that not to use your personal phones mobile phones for you know uh, clicking pictures or recording the classroom activities but it that depends on the school some schools they have photographer they have school photographer who come who assist you with that but some schools may not have in that case you may we may use our mobile phones but we ensure that we are not storing the students pictures in our in a personal devices because that is also in a violation of the child i mean uh, violating the child rights because we have no right to store child personal details in our mobile phones okay so now comes to the factor why okay we all are educated okay and we all are interested in the child protection okay we we are genuinely interested in say you know uh, take caring or taking care of the child then what factors preventing us from under reporting okay so the study says that the research says that these are the reasons lack of knowledge so teachers or the faculty do not know how to identify the child abuse cases so lack of knowledge of the signs and symptoms of the child abuse lack of knowledge of reporting procedure when we do not know who to report when to, how to report obviously we hesitate to report to the child abusing cases so lack of knowledge of the reporting procedure and finally fear of making inaccurate report so we are not sure whether my my report this report is the right report or not okay but my suggestion is here that okay, speaking from my experience Uh, making the inaccurate report is better than under reporting because making inaccurate report may prevent the child may, may it's okay it's okay after the investigation we realize that i mean there is no credibility in that reporting but under reporting may harm the child so under reporting may you know allow the child may put the child at risk so these are the reasons for teachers or the faculty are you know under report why they under report it now so what to do when child approach you okay what is your responsibility just three things listen to them 
reassure them and respect them so give them a safe place okay take them to a safe place and then listen to them what they have to tell you so avoid quizzing okay when you quiz when you ask questions okay they get confused okay so there are chances for the fabrication of the issues so we have to actively listen to them and then assure them that it is okay okay it is okay and i also appreciate you for coming and reporting to me you are brave girl or brave boy okay and then respect so respect in the sense don't expect a child to explain too much from you or don't expect the child what you want to know that so you have to listen to the child what they have to tell you so listen reassure and respect are the three things that we must do when child you know reach to us and school's responsibility okay so we have been talking about child protection okay and what is staff responsibility you know what should a school do okay so generally i mean school should have child protection policy it is important essential that schools have child protection policy because the policy guides us how to what how to create a safe environment what are the do's and don'ts what are the staff responsibilities and what is the consequences of if anybody violates or anybody you know abuse the child so child protection policy is must for schools and then there should be a child protection committee okay yes all educators are responsible for taking care of the children okay there is no denial of that but having a designated officer or officers is always essential for to schools to ensure that the child protection is practiced seamlessly and then having the sessions schools should conduct periodical sessions for the for their faculty on legal framework and child protection situations okay so i'll just go quickly brief walk you through you know what is the, i mean why it is important to have a policy what are the aims and objectives of child protection policy for schools so if schools has child protection policy that will you know raise the awareness of the child protection issues and it will also help us to identify and reporting the suspected cases of the abuse and third thing is the child protection plan a policy has to clearly stipulate the plan what is the child protection plan how to investigate the child protection cases okay what are the consequences what is the remedies for that what are the preventive measures for that so the child protection plan has to be clearly mentioned in the policy and finally policy is to establish a safe environment where children have opportunity to learn and develop positively so reporting procedure okay i will be talking about what is the reporting procedure generally you know the schools have the report the, this is the structure that my school is following okay so uh, not necessary that every school should have the same structure but schools can have can tailor the structure uh, i mean the reporting procedure what suits to their hierarchy and their system so this this structure explains you that child protection officer is the one who receives the reports okay child protection officer can receive the report from teacher or student or parent or social counselor if school has so because student can approach teacher student may approach their parent or student can approach the social counselor whoever they believe the trusted adult so they approach them so once the report is received and then child protection officer or the designated the officer who is responsible for the child protection will immediately inform their committee if there is a committee or else whoever is concerned okay they will form a committee and then they take the statements and collect the evidences to start the investigation remember i mean i want you all to note one point here the child protection cases has to, investigation has to be started within 24 hours okay this is what our legal system expects so and then inform the head of the school or the principal 
Okay, and then notifying the Child Protection Committee members, and then we start in with, you have to investigate the allegations, review the statements, and then they talk, know about the alleged victim and perpetrators, abusers, and what all, all the details that we require, collect all the details and evidences for the investigation. So after the thorough investigation, if allegation found not credible, then no further investigation, okay? And we inform the student parents. Okay, here I want you to know that, I mean, the abuse can happen between student and student or student and adult. If the abuse, and if the abuser is a fellow student, okay, if the abuser is also a child, so it is important that we inform both the parents and the victim and the, you know, uh, the, the abuser. So both the parents should be informed. Any child protection issues has to be investigated. I mean, prior to that, we have to inform the parents. And there are chances parents also can be the abuser. If that is the case, then we have to start the investigation. After the thorough investigation, at right time, we have to involve the parents. So if the in after the investigation, if the case is found in not credible, and then we, you know, we there are no consequences and we inform the parents and the student. But in other case, if the allegation found credible, then there are consequences. So these consequences clearly has to be mentioned in the child protection policy. Okay. So and inform the head of the school or the principal, inform the parent, and then the possible consequences are sanctioned. Okay. And then refer both the children, if it is the child to child, student to student, or if it's student and adult. So our, I mean, it is responsibility that schools to give enough opportunities for the children to realize of their actions. So we refer them to the social counselor. So this is the structure we have in our school. Okay. Generally, any school has the reporting procedure. But yes, as I said that, as per the hierarchy, as per the system, school can tailor their reporting procedures. But what is important, by and large, the importance is that we have to start the investigation immediately. We have to involve all the persons concerned, and there should be proper investigation plan, and children should be given opportunities to realize their actions. And children should feel that they are heard and they are protected. Okay. Now, what who, I mean, why, what is Child Protection Committee? As I mentioned earlier, it is good that schools have designated people, okay, safeguarding committee. You can call this as a Child Protection Committee or Safeguarding Committee or POXO Committee. Now we have POXO Act, okay? It is important that the schools adhere to the POXO Act. So there can be a POXO Committee. It, it can be called as a POXO Committee also. I think, you know, uh, what I learned from the trainings that I have attended, now, you know, the Indian government is insisting that the school should have POXO committee. Okay, so who all can be the Child Protection Committee members? Yes, Child Protection Officer who receives the complaints and takes actions. And there can be a Deputy Child Protection Officer that depends on the size of the school. If the school is big, then there can be a Deputy Child Protection Officer. In our school, we have two, two Deputy Child Protection Officers along with me, who is the Child Protection Officer. And then Principal, Counselor and School Nurse. So Child Protection Officer and Deputy Child Protection Officers are the permanent members. Okay, statutory members of the committee who constantly work on the child protection. Principal, counselor, and school nurse are the people who can be part of the committee as need based. That depends on the case. So this is, I mean, this is the one structure of the child protection committee. Now, if there is a child protection officer, then what is the responsibility of the child protection officer or the designated officer? So the child protection officer or the designated officer is the one who receives the reports, okay? And then they ensure that staff are familiar with the child protection policy. So the policy has to be a circulated to all, you know, staff members, both teaching and non-teaching faculty, and ensure that the policy is implemented 
and they represent the school to the statutory agencies. See, in case of FOXO cases, we have to work with the police. So in that case, the child protection officer or the designated officer who, who represents the school to the external agencies and maintaining, updating the policy, uh, cre creating awareness in the school. Children should be conducted sensitization sessions to know about what is child abuse, how to keep themselves safe from the harm and risk, and providing guidance on relevant matters to the child protection committee to the other members. So these are the I mean the main responsibilities of the child protection officer. Now, what are the child protection acts? Okay, so I will uh, I will just because of the time constraint, I may not go in detail of these acts. So I will just brief you, give a glance of the what are the acts. So we have two acts, you know, with uh, with regard to the child protection, Juvenile Justice Act of 2015, and you know, Protection of Children from Sexual Offence Act, which is in short called as POXO 2012. So JJ Act. So JJ Act mainly focuses on corporal punishments. Okay, yes, corporal punishments. I don't have to explain all this, but it, I mean, I'm glad that the current school systems, the corporal punishments are slowly banished or reduced. But it is sad. I mean, at the same time, I'm also sad to share with you that there are st still some schools in the remote areas. I happened to visit a school uh, in a village. OK, I don't want to uh, reveal the name of the village and school name. I, st I mean, I, w I mean, I was shocked to see that the teacher hitting the child. OK, teacher has a long stick, you know, and then hitting the child. So hitting, punching, twisting, pushing, you know, or, you know, um, ear twisting. These are all some of the corporate, making the child standing in a, in a corner, okay? Isolating the child, keeping the child in a dark room, keeping the child in a separate room. So these are all some of the actions teachers tend to do in the name of correcting the child, but they are never they never help the child in a positive way so those are the corporal punishments so this act juvenile justice act addresses the cases of child abuse and enforces strong penalties stronger penalties of those who found the guilty of exploiting or abusing the children and the next act is poxo act so POXO Act is, you know, focusing on the protecting children from sexual abuses, offenses. So any sexual activity with a child under 18, okay, irrespective of the concern, the Act clearly says that any adult who has, you know, who has or who forced the child to have sex or who has the child's consent, who takes the consent and have sex also, you know, illegal. It is offensive. Okay. So irrespective of the consent, because it is considered that the children at the age below the age of 18 are, you know, are legally not ready, biologically, legally or physically, they are not ready to take the right decisions. So it is clear, the POXO Act clearly states that any adult who has uh, no sex with the child under 18 or consider, is considered as an offense and POXO Act has a severe consequences, okay, to dealing with this kind of the cases. So these are the two legal acts, you know, are there in Indian legal system to protect children um, along with the children rights you know, under the uh, guaranteed by the United Nations Convention on Rights of Child. Okay, so with that, we have come to the conclusion of the session. Thank you for, once again, thank you for attending the session. Okay, I would be happy to have any questions if you have. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, uh, if you can stop sharing the screen, sure. I'm afraid to say that, uh, you know, I just got an update that like the session might end. The Zoom gave me the message. So quickly, one thing I'll ask you uh, that what are the challenges the schools face to implement these acts, ma'am? Okay, the challenges is lack of knowledge. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we, I mean, if we do not clearly understand, it is, I mean, I know we all are not legal experts, okay? So, but it is, as I mentioned, that there should be a designated person 
who study about this laws i mean legal uh, framework and then they have to create con they can conduct the sessions for the uh, staff to understand that what are what actions lead to the child uh, child abuse and what are the uh, legal uh, actions are in place so the big challenge is lack of knowledge so the i mean we in our school we often conduct once in trimester we conduct the sessions so like that the schools can plan to conduct the regular sessions to create awareness for the staff members thanks a lot ms dana anything else you want to mention like before like uh, the zoom doesn't permit us to continue okay so my only thing is that i mean teachers should be very careful and then careful i mean i don't mean that they are i mean they should be afraid of this matter but you know i suggest that teachers to learn read about the child protection and engage their students in a safe environment where the learning is impactful great ma'am thank you for the talk and for patiently answering the questions uh, the session was very informative and uh, thank you once again for your uh, time and thank sharing you. your knowledge on our platform thank I you see. for the opportunity ms pravina thank you so much have a great day ma'am